you all for coming to Biosphere Climate Change and People. It's really good to see you this evening. My name's Laura Rawlings and I present the afternoon show on BBC Radio Bristol and I'm the person who's going to guide you through this evening's entertainment. I was here for last night's Biosphere event, I don't know if any of you were, but um, it was about poetry, climate change and the planet and it was it was great. It was about a kind of a combination between celebrating nature and also wanting to protect it. And it called me to action. And when I went home, I actually started looking up other climate change poems by all sorts of different people. You know, you start off in one place on the internet and then you find out you've ended up somewhere totally different. Um, and I came across one by Andrew Motion and it's called The Sorcerer's Mirror. Now it's a little bit too long, so I'm not gonna read it to you tonight, but it's a poem that I definitely urge you to go and have a look at if you're not already familiar with it. But there was another one that I came across um, on a similar theme by Paul Munden, and I wanted to share it with you because it kind of sums thing up for me. It's called Mitigation. So I'll just, just a short one, I promise. But um, here we go. I curb the speed of my four by four and ease my conscience. I switch to a low wattage bulb and feel enlightened. I water my garden with rain and take the credit. I recycle my newspapers and the headlines go away. And in my job as a journalist, I get to read loads of different reports, quite fat reports, digesting lots of facts and figures. And I have to say that it's incredible that just in those eight lines of poetry, um, that actually made me look at what I do and kind of nudged me into action more so than any of the big reports that I've read previously. And that's what tonight is actually about. It's a, it's a part of what tonight is about. So it's really great that the Arts Council has decided to fund this biosphere as a pilot study of the themes. We've got a fantastic international panel of award-winning poets lined up for you. Um, we've got Rebecca Tantoni, who's here with us. We've got Dean Atta, Ted Chamberlain, and Steve Duncan. Um, the format for this evening, I'm just going to run through it very quickly now because it's important that you know, because actually your participation is really important in this. So the way it will work is each of our poets is going to take it in turns to go up and perform for us on stage um, a selection of their work, some new, some that they may have written already. And then after everyone has done their turn, you get a chance to ask some questions. So I really hope that you do ask questions or share your thoughts, because you know what it's like, you're listening to something and kind of triggers off all sorts of different feelings, reflections, responses to stuff. So if you could kind of catch a handle on that, save it and then share it with us at the end, that would be brilliant. If you can't and you just want to send a tweet, well, that's fine, um, you can use the hashtag which is FON2014, so Festival of Nature 2014. You can tweet your thoughts there if you would like to. So that's how we're going to do this. Um, but without further ado, we're going to hear from our first poet of the night. She's the director of the Applied Theatre Action Institute. It's all about theatre and spoken word. They do an international programme where young people kind of work out the solutions to today's big issues. She's just finished her first publication of short stories. And more importantly than all of this, um, she told me earlier that she has some exceptional dance moves and maybe we'll get to see them as she goes up to the left <laughs> she'll throw some shapes. Please give a very warm welcome to Rebecca Tantoni. Thank you very much. Um, I'd just like to say it's a real honour to be here and to have been asked to do this commission. I, as a poet, what I write about is the personal, and I'm always trying to understand what, you know, these large, large topics in life mean to me on a personal level. And when writing this piece, and I've written a piece of travel writing, which is massively out of my comfort zone, but it was the best way for me to personally respond to the topic at hand. And before I begin it, I would just like to say I work a lot with teenagers from all over the world. Groups in Bristol, from the ghetto in Oakland, California, from Cairo and Jordan to Hong Kong. And one thing that I find in working with these young people and discussing societal topics that affect them is that there are always solutions and there is always hope in everything that they respond with. And that's what has inspired me to, um, to write this piece of work. And sit back, enjoy it, it's 15 minutes, time slot, and um, 
I hope you do enjoy it as much as I enjoyed living the experience. It's called Waiting for the End of the World to Come and Find Us. I have never felt more lost than I did in the summer of 2009. For a month, I was anxiously fluttering around like a moth caught up in the desire to leave my bedroom, but confused by the world outside of my window. In between relationships, in the middle of moving house and about to start my studies, I finally left home and traveled across Europe, slept in a thin tent with a large rip in its roof. It hardly ever rained, but sometimes the wind would slip in through a gap and make the night sleep uncomfortable and when it did, time dragged so slowly forward that I felt like the rest of my existence would be lived in darkness. I stared up at the constellations, found reminders in the sky of how vast and how tiny we are, how empty and yet how full up. In four months, I had hitchhiked on Spanish roads, jumped in Croatian waterfalls and drunk sugary mint tea on Moroccan carpets. After Europe, I went to India, where I climbed the banks of the Ganga, watched women wash brightly coloured fabric in its murky waters, Brahmin priests and barefoot Indian boys running along cobbled alleyways. I found the people of the world and I learnt about that point of connectivity. I'd been brought up on structures and systems, institutions and concepts built on the belief that we are flawed, that we are tragedies in need of saving. And yet, I found triumph. I found gods in tiny rundown cafes and cathedrals in slums. I found societies that knew solutions. Civilizations that were sustainable, the collapse and rise of a fragile human species who knew exactly what to do. But by August of the same year, I only had the memories. Reminders triggered by the smell of takadar or how the plough lay in the sky above me. I remember staring up at the damp ceiling of my bedroom, longing for a rip to appear in the plaster and show me what was waiting outside the confines of my house. I remember wondering how it was that I could unite all of those experiences, those people, by saying where I was, the infinite capacity to grow, connect and explore the trajectory within us all. Three years later, December, 2012, I was in Mexico, waiting for the end of the world to come. Nicholas and I had landed among dead dogs strewn on the roadside and an orchestra of beeping carts. Among 10 million people fighting their way through 10 million people, we'd landed into lost languages, lost cultures, the descending steps of moon temples and the walkways of death, into Frida Kahlo's home, Seeing the bed where she painted, slept, fucked, felt like her pain was so heavy it could have suffocated her. We'd landed into warm people who drew our uncertainties with their eyes, who made us feel unique into colour and passion, into forgetting how much we relied on speech into the hot, dry sun. We travelled through back canals, past clucking hens and palm trees, past kingfishers and restaurants where loud, happy families spilt out through entrances. We clung on to each other, not knowing how to speak as well as we'd like to, forgetting ourselves, our names, our ages. We didn't have the capacity to tell anyone who we were and why we were there. We could no longer sell ourselves, add details, charm others with our words. We were simply polite and humble left only with the desire to give back to the place that was speaking for us. In the evenings, we dined in caves, lit up by thousands of candles, eating cheeses, beans, meats, fresh vegetables, drinking cinnamon rice and watching traditional dancers move parts of their bodies that had long been redundant to us. We explored Oaxaca and its crafts. Beautiful, black-haired women sat in huddles by thin roads their old hands weaving brightly coloured threads. Ornate cathedrals stood proud over market plazas where stools sold wooden animals painted ocean blue and neon pink. We counted down how long we had left until the world ended. Just five days. So we headed for Palenque, 
for tropical jungle, for slick black jaguars and spiders with the faces of children. And there, in the stomach of the rainforest, under heavy sabaya trees surrounded by Mayan ruins, we joined a gathering of 2,000 people. The world was at crisis point. We all knew that. The ice caps were melting into oceans, the oceans were rising, the gap between rich and poor was growing, and urbanization was slowly destroying the places that we were all now standing in. Calendars end, and calendars begin, but time cannot be measured by starts and finishes. That's how most of us knew next year we'd still be breathing, and the world would still be intact. Yet we were there, alongside Mexican farm workers, and an accountant named George from Detroit, alongside a teenager from Stockholm who had cycled the entire way, alongside Alan from Birmingham, who had swapped a lad's stag do in Tenerife for naked hippies that smelt of incense and adventure. We came together for the Mayan end of the world because we no longer wanted to carry on pretending we were helpless, because we wanted to mark the start of change. The end came as a tropical storm. On the 21st of December 2012, heavy rain made the pools of the rainforest overflow and carry tents, passports and wallets downstream. Hundreds of us watched as our tiny dreams and huge ambitions were taken by the water, our identities lost again and again as nature began redefining all of us. Our eyes became its streams our backs its bark, our stomach its banks, the light left the day and our shadows became its nightfall as we all tried to discover who we were there. Listening to the forest's voice echo our own, telling us it was something worth finding. Nicholas originally found Rabin on the Camino de Santiago in 2010 walking his way across foothills, finding answers in solitude and discovering peace in the faces of strangers. By chance, we found him again, at the end of the world gathering, and after slept at his house the night before we were going home. Rabin was Mexican, born just south of the country's capital, Cancun, a city full of weathered tourists, cheap alcohol and expensive stores. He spent the past seven years living in its eastern tip. Rabin was the owner of a branch of wedding shops, and when he wasn't walking through Spain, he worked hard, holding the hands of his wife and two children, slipping in and out of his desire to be a part of his community and the want to be incredibly alone. Cancun is a plastic city, Rabin told us that evening. But if people see you have money, there's trouble. Money means everything here, and the less you pretend you have, the less danger you're in. We are sat in his apartment. Hot eggs were being cooked by his wife, Isabella, and his two children huddled together watching bright images flash across the television screen. Rabin sat across from us. He was a tall, wide man with eyes the size of onion bulbs and a deep voice. Behind us, his nameless Rottweiler nuzzled through the muslin that separated the garden from the kitchen. We could just see the shape of his mouth through the cloth. Does he bite? I asked, stretching my fingers out towards the window. Yes, he does. Sometimes, Rabin said. Like humans, he doesn't like everyone. I instantly snatched my fingers away. The curtain moved like calm rivers, ripples on its water. The smell of breakfast infused the air, and we were all hungry for something. I once went in search of the mouth of Agua Azul, Rabin remarked. It's a waterfall south of here. When I got close to it, I found a small lake with a fisherman in the middle. I shouted over to him, I'm looking for Agua Azul. Where do I go from here? And he shouted back to me that it was behind the house across the bridge. But I'm sorry, he said to me. I can't take you to shore. That part of our village belongs to the Zapatistas. Nicholas and I had heard stories about the Zapatistas. Once, when driving through Palenque in the back of a pickup truck, we saw them huddled on the roadside and smoking cigarettes through their balaclavas. They are a left-wing rebel group, libertarian socialists with a thirst for change, fighting for the rights of our planet and the people in it. I found out 
that their village was separated in two rabbin sets. The side where I stood was filled with concrete houses and television sets, and the other half belonged to the Zapatistas. I had to pass through the rebels' territory to get to the waterfall, but I had to swim across the lake first. The rope that connected them to the other side of the village had been cut. Once across, someone helped me to shore, and I was instantly given new clothes and fed good, good food. I spent three nights there, listening to music, singing songs under the moon, telling them news of Mexico, and they made me feel alive. Their community was something harmonious. They were fighting for multilingual schools, seed banks, sustainable agriculture, affordable clinics, and above all, democracy. They were fighting for equality, environmental, political, and cultural rights. They were angry because of the disproportionate wealth that played itself out in their own village. But in spite of this, they showed themselves to be examples of generosity. I tried to give them some money in the morning. There wasn't a lot there and I'd been really looked after, yet they shrugged me off. What do we need money for, they asked. It brings nothing but confusion. Give us time to care for one another. That is all we want to exchange here. Isabella carried a sizzling pan full of eggs and peppers over to us. She placed it on the table next to a pile of tortillas wrapped in a tea towel and a bowl of refried beans, spicy avocados and cheeses. We began helping ourselves, scooping piles of home-cooked food onto our plates. We've never eaten meat before, Isabella said. In 34 years, I have never once eaten meat in a country that digests carcasses like they drink water. We were silent for a while, chewing and drinking in turn. Did you find the waterfall? I asked. Yes, I did. And it was grand and it was mesmerizing. Rabin's eyes flickered. Yep, what I remember most were the people. Wherever you go in the world, any landscape you find yourself in, it's the people that you take home with you. He smiled at Nicholas. As I looked at the faces around the table, Rabin's mother had joined us. I watched the children as they climbed onto Isabella's lap to snatch handfuls of tortillas. It was the same at the end of the world gathering, wasn't it? Yes, there were temples and, and rainforests, but when I'm asked, how was it? The first thing I say is, man, there were some people. We laughed, and four months' worth of memories passed through us like a current might. Remember the marketplace, Nicholas asked. Rabin and I nodded. At the end of the world gathering, there had been a small pathway that had snaked through the middle of the tents. It was a place where people sold or exchanged their goods and practices. There were massages being offered and sculptures and jewelry from Asia for double the price that it should have been. People were selling anything, Rabin said to his wife, stones, bits of wood from the ground, Yet I met this one guy who was selling answers. On a piece of wood, in four languages he'd written, ask me any existential question. So I did. And he said, sorry, I only speak French. I don't speak French, I told him, but I'll stay anyway. And I did, and we spoke for three hours. I still asked my questions and he still gave his answers. It's incredible what you can hear when you really listen. We'd found answers in silence, in stories, in everything we'd gathered along our wobbly journey so far. We'd taken ourselves across continents in search of something, learning again and again that we could find it in everything we'd always had before. In the city, behind the street signs, carved into tree bark, in the familiarity of our families, in the jobs we'd always hated and the dreams we'd worked so hard to obtain. We were lucky enough to be there, with such warm people, their hearts as open as cupboards, and yet we had to leave soon. Tomorrow, Nicholas and I would be returning back to everything we'd left behind, ready to discover it over and over again. I met a woman at the gathering. Rabin said. She was probably in her late 50s. She looked tired, full of stories, but tired. She had three children with her. Isabella held her son and daughter close to her chest. 
The woman told me that she'd been moving around for 38 years in search of paradise, trying to find the perfect place, bringing everything along with her. Yet everywhere she went, she saw the problems and she left again. In Ghana, there was drought. In New Orleans, there were hurricanes. And near Scotland, there were slick oil spills. We stared at Rabin, at his wide eyes and mouth like the sea, at his big hands spread across the table and over to his mother, by his side, his wife and children surrounding him. I felt sad, I wanted to say. I wanted to say, stop, stop here, where you are now because you are searching for something that doesn't exist, something you will never find, work with what you have to make it worth staying for. We are all silent listening to his words, to the fan whipping the air, faint car horns of one another's breath. But I didn't say anything about that. Instead, I saw my own life, my own story, my own need to be anywhere other than here, and I realised something. He paused. And so did we, like time had been building its ticks up to where greatness was going to be revealed. It's something that she already has, that I already have, this capacity to embrace what is left and help make it grow. Back home, I am in a city that I believe in. As the Zapatistas say, everything for everyone, nothing for us. It's only thin paper cut walls that separate our stories. There is only so long that the earth can speak in tongues until we listen. There's only so long that islands of stones throw and brightens in spitting distance. Only so long that the resistance takes a stand as a Cambodian man burning his body for justice. There's only so long that we can mute the sound of the Arctic. There is only so long that we can look upwards for answers instead of around us. We are this, grassroots, ground up. We are empty and we are stuffed, but we are capable. That thing we're destroying isn't something separate, something outside, it is ourselves. We are nature, it is us, home. The desert in our bellies, the ocean in our bones, we have found the solutions. We just need to start committing to them. We just need to realize that we are something worth saving. Thank you, Rebecca. I mean, what a journey to start us off with and a message as well there. So many things, but work with what you have. It is us, all really powerful. And your ability to paint pictures and observations, the line, eyes the size of onion bulbs. I mean, that's just a brilliant one. I wish my travel journals would kind of have those kind of details in. It's incredible. So um, thank you very much for getting thank us you. going. Right, on to our next poet of the evening. Um, he's the award-winning poet, Dean Atta. Dean's been commissioned by a variety of well-known organisations to write poetry, including the Damalola Taylor Trust, the National Portrait Gallery, Tate Britain, and Tate Modern. And when I was preparing for this evening, I had a look at some of Dean's previous interviews, and in one of them, I saw he said that poetry was his saving grace. And I quote this bit, to write about what matters to you is one thing, but then to speak it out loud is often a life-changing experience when you know you have been truly heard. And I think that's really striking. So please welcome Dean Atta. Hello, I'm so, so happy to be here. Um, I've written some new pieces for today, um, so I'll be sharing them, as well as some pieces from my, um, my poetry collection. And um, yeah, a lot of the pieces you're going to hear relate to water, so I'm so glad we're by water. And um, I think a lot of what I'm going to say is going to speak back to what Rebecca said as well, which is really nice to hear already. There's some threads that are going to probably be seen through all the way um, this evening. So I'm going to start. The first piece I want to share with you is called The Mix-Up. And um, I wrote this in answer to a question I get asked all the time, where are you from? Um, I think we want to 
save the world, but people always want to pin us down to one particular place, um, which is really interesting. Um, but this is my response, the mix-up. Cypriot relatives called me the black one. Jamaican family called me English boy. And here I am asked, where are you from? Not Cypriot and not Jamaican. My British passport lays my strongest foundation. Parts of me are still lost at sea, shackled to painful memories. Parts of me are bullet holes in abandoned buildings in a more than thrice conquered Mediterranean island. British soldiers patrol my border. Racism is rarely a downpour. You never know whether to put up your umbrella for the drizzle. But when you get home, you realize you are soaking wet. And the next piece I'm gonna share talks about water in a metaphor. Um, and it talks about water um, and teaching. And so this is called What It's Like to Teach, another short one. It's like, I see confusion melting into recognition. It's a drip, 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 and then a flow. Sometimes it spills over. It can bubble and boil. When you misjudge its temperature, when it floats away, you pray it's not gone for good. You rain dance in the hope of a shower of thoughts returning and cupped hands taking a sip. So I've been working for the past year, um, school year, in a, in a secondary and primary school actually. There are two schools next door to each other. Um, so I work with year five and six in the primary school and year seven and eight and nine in the secondary school. And I see a lot of things and I get young people to write poetry and um, get them to perform their poetry. And like you said in that quote, have that experience of being truly heard. And I think that's so important. Um, and I think Sometimes teachers forget to really think about why students do what they do, say what they say. Um, and so this is a small piece. Um, this is one of the pieces I wrote for today, um, looking at kind of climate change, the environment, and thinking about those issues. Um, it's called, Can I Kick It? Um, so who knows the response to that? Can I kick it? Yes. Can I kick it? Yes. <laughs> All right, well, there's not a call and response in this. I just wanted to get you to do that. Um, so this is um, a piece um, set in a school corridor. Can I kick it? Girl kicks a can down school corridor. When teacher asks her to pick it up, says, it's not mine. Teacher takes no time to talk to her about responsibility or taking pride in her environment. Teacher, quick to take offense at her insolence, issues her a detention for answering back. Another disposable lesson is taught. Consequences kicked around like inevitable punishment. With cans in corridors up and down the country and litter on the streets across all of the cities. Teaching is a profession. Cleaning is a profession. But maybe we could all try to teach this lesson. All right, and this next poem was actually inspired by someone um, tweeted, I'm on Twitter, at Dean Atta, if you want to follow me, um, but someone tweeted this lovely little saying, which I'm still considering whether I believe it, but it did inspire me to write this poem. This poem's called Ecosystem, but the person tweeted, each human body is an ecosystem unto itself. And so I was thought about that, and this is my poem, Ecosystem. Each human body is an ecosystem unto itself, she says. I consider her words and how they speak to my current task to write a poem about climate change. I can choose how to pollute myself, how to treat myself, eat, drink, and inhale whatever I want. Consequences known, so excuses are none. For, what, um, for the things I do and what I consume, to decrease stress, forget, or have fun. These are the choices I make for my body. Slightly overweight, drink a bit too much, don't smoke unless it has an extra touch. I am out of touch with myself, desensitized and overstimulated. Every orifice of this human body perme permeated, letting the outside in, putting my insides out through a pen or a keypad, iPad, 
I phone, I never alone, I often lonely, I taking very little responsibility for this world around me. I'm not a climate change denier, I recycle, I don't drive a car, but I know I have bars when I could shower. I know I take flights when I could take boats or trains, but I like planes. To defy gravity and to see as much of this small planet as I can, I, one man, a dot on a dot, in a great big universe, we take our own lives for granted, as well as our mother, Earth. And this piece is called Flying Solo. Mother said, I could swim as a baby. I learned to fly as a man. My wings are made of money, metal, privilege, poetry. I am unearthed from my roots, disconnected from my past. I am a technology native. I exist online most of the time. I wrote this poem on my phone. If you ask me to call home, there's only one number I would ring. It is a house in Northwest London. Do I belong to this city? Streets paved with microchips and genetically modified lives. I am forgetting to back up my hard drive. If enough of us store our lives in the clouds, one day we will reign. I only care about animals I know by name. I only care about people I know by name. I only care about what I am able to explain. I am losing my religion. I pray to be forgiven. I want to care more. I want to be cared for. I want the leaves to love me. I want the wind to woo me. I want raindrops to rejoice me. I want the sun to salute me. I want respect that I don't give because I can't think past this one life I live. And this is on our horizon. I used to watch the stars, but now I watch the waves. The stars are in the past and their lights are bright graves. We cannot control our suns, though I'm sure we will seek to. And there's no one out there that I'm aware we're able to speak to. But I look in our own skies, on the ground and in the seas. How many of us recognize every bird, animal and fish species? There's so much more to know about this planet of ours. Why, do we look, why don't we look out on our horizon before we look up at the stars? And this, I think, is my favorite of the new ones I wrote. Um, it's called Reassuringly Small. And I wrote this um, about, it's all explained in there, but um, Brighton, I used to live in Brighton for three years and um, used to go and sit on the beach and just feel small, which is nice, actually. Um, reassuringly small. Almost every day for three years, he would go and sit on that Brighton beach, let his breathing catch the timing of the waves, meditate if you will. He did not swim or surf or paddle. He never set foot in the water at all. But for three years, almost every day, he would go and sit on that Brighton beach. He loved to know he lived on an island. He knew his people were island people. He was an island, boy becoming a man. He was at university, discovering his identity. He saw a wide open sea stretched out before him, but he knew the big city was where he'd return. Rivers and canals were what he knew, the paths he followed. The arteries of London were never the roads. He has never driven a car, no desire for it, he always wanted to fly, to space if he could. When he sat there on the beach, he would close his eyes, picture his position on the coastline, see the whole country, continents and planets, feel reassuringly small in the grand scheme of it all, like a pebble on that Brighton beach. He has returned years later as a visitor, glad to be where the pebbles know they are not mountains out of London, where egos are as tall as buildings. And to catch his breath, he remembers the sea. All right, so now I want to share some other pieces. Um, so some of these are gonna be from my book. Um, and I published this book last year, and um, it's my first poetry collection. And um, yeah, there's more water and 
stuff like that and, and flying. Yeah. Um, this is called Ascension and it goes like this. I rise, I have risen, and yet I feel like I'm falling. Falling from grace, falling short of my potential, falling out of favour with those who expected, predicted, were counting on so much for me and my future. If this is the future, take me back to the past, when I had hopes, dreams and ambitions, and not just debts, regrets and not quite yet. When a blank page offered up infinite possibilities and not just a potential paycheck, and an escape from a job where I get no respect. And yet I rise to positions of responsibility and accountability. I rise to catalyst desires, not at school waiting for playtime, but at work, waiting for payday, daydreaming of a playdate where butterflies would lift off from a pit of acid, rise and make noise in the form of words, strung together as a puppeteer connects to a puppet. I rise to the occasion, I've been cocooned too long. My flight is imminent. I boil over in a storm. Though torrential rain may descend upon me, the same water that sustains my being and form, I rise above and beyond, standing on the wings of the butterflies and treading the raindrops like a stairway to heaven. And so although they fall, I rise, like the towers that scrape the skies. Though oxygen is thin up here, I stand tall while others crawl and gasp for breath. I breathe the air of the gods filled with stardust and plane emissions. I don't need an engine for my ascension. I rise from sleep and depression and found that all other psychological conditions remained. And within a system of liars, the truth seems like insanity. So how do I defy gravity? I rise free from my former inhibitions to realize the only opinions that matter to me are that of God and my mother. See, with a clear destination and a strong foundation, you don't have to fear precipitation if you understand the cycle any more than a river fears evaporation. The sea has been in the sky, so why can't I? I rise, I fall, and through it all, I learn to linger a little higher. And the next piece I wanna share is called Quit Me. I think um, we want people to be responsible for this planet that we're on. But a lot of people can't be responsible for themselves. And um, I think that's where we need to start. Um, so Quit Me is about any addiction you want to think of for yourself or someone you know. If you gave yourself a deadline to quit, it wouldn't make it any easier for you. So you should just cut me off right now. Or else you'll abuse your dependence on me until the very last day of your futile countdown. Your lips will miss me softly pressed against them. Your body will yearn for me to cause my way inside you. You'll reach out for me, and then someone will remind you that you said you don't want me. In fact, you resent me. And then your whole life will seem pointless and empty without me as your fix in the morning, at lunch, after work, or for comfort and counsel last thing at night. You say I help you to relax. I ease your mind. You open up with me because I put a welcome haze over reality. Albeit momentarily, I help you to cope with this so-called life where you're misunderstood and things go bad when all you try to do is good. I know you over-exaggerate and I indulge you and that's the worst thing I can possibly do. And when you cannot have me, you'll take it out on your friends and family. You'll reach out, you'll break down when you see another with me. I wasn't trying to trap you in this habitual cycle. I just came to offer you relief. But now you think I'm your only hope of happiness, and I'm the only one you turn to in times of stress and grief. Your life was rich and full before me, and it can be again. You're stronger than this. You can do it now if you done did it then. See, the good I do for you is not good enough if I daily infect you and cause you pain. So you've been warned against me. You've heard the stories, but you take this risk because you think I'm worth it. You think that you're informed and you truly know me. But if you only knew how much I could hurt you, you'd think twice before you reached out for me. All right, and um, this piece is called New Year. Um, and I think, actually I don't know what year I wrote it, but it's about that idea of setting New Year's resolutions and saying I'm gonna change at this point in time when you can change any time you want. Um, and so this is about our kind of setting of those goals um, and it goes like this 
New year, new ideas here, new hopes, new dreams, from which I awake, my body starts to shake, sending a vibration through this nation. I seem cold, they seem old, those resolutions, rehashed and reheated, returned from last year, partially defeated, hopefully committed to, hopefully this time. Held aloft by you, but exposed by this rhyme, you took the easy way out. You're so proud about your once a year success. Earth rotates in distress. A smoke signal ascends to universal friends for some sort of solution to the state of revulsion. I feel repulsion, yet I feel liable. If we're not aiding, we're adding to it. That is undeniable. And you fake it once more. What you call charity has already been paid for in blood, sweat, and tears over hundreds of years. New year, new ideas here. Take a new stance, a new view. This is a new chance for a new you. Thank you. Dean, thank you. Wow. What a finish. And um, when he smiles like that, it's just amazing. It's like the full joy. I'd have loved you as my teacher. <laughs> Can you kick it, you said right at the start? Yeah. Yes, you can. Um, exactly. I didn't need to prompt you. The way you weave in nature, also, you know, not afraid to take on some of the other big issues as well inside of that. And I actually ran out of space. I was noting down little points, thinking about when you did ecosystem, the twist on iPads to the place of I and all of that, weaving in song titles, then talking about being, you know, feeling small. And I think we all related to that. And then the sigh that came at the end of Ascension, there was like this collective agreement of, yes, we all know what you mean there. So that was great. Thank you very much. Um, right, onwards to our next poet of the night. And one of the things that really stands out about this poet for me is that his interest in stories and songs has taken him on an adventure around the world from the Aboriginal peoples in North America to the hunters of the Kalahari and the herders of Mongolia. He was Professor of English and Comparative Literature at the University of Toronto. I'm really delighted to welcome to the stage our next poet, Ted Chamberlain. <laughs> Thank you very much, and special thanks uh, to Asif and to Savita for the invitation to be here, and thanks to all of you. The sailor was standing on a mountain on an island far out in the ocean. He was marooned, and he wasn't very happy about it, so he wrote a poem. I am monarch of all I survey, it begins. My right there is none to dispute. From the center all around to the sea, I am lord of the fowl and the brute. Society, friendship, and love divinely bestowed upon man. Oh, had I the wings of a dove, how soon would I taste you again? The sailor's name was Alexander Selkirk, and his story was the inspiration for Daniel Defoe's novel, Robinson Crusoe. However, the author of this poem, titled Verses Supposed to be Written by Alexander Selkirk, wasn't Selkirk but the English poet William Cooper, and the supposed was just a literary convention, like Defoe's claim that his novel was written by Crusoe. The popularity of Cooper's island poem went far beyond literary circles in his lifetime. In fact, in its day, these verses were almost as famous as the song Amazing Grace is in ours. And there was a connection. Cooper's name may have faded, but in his lifetime, the latter half of the 18th century, he was very well known. No less a literary critic than Coleridge called him our best modern poet. And Cooper had become a household name because of his collaboration with the Reverend John Newton in writing a series of hymns to go along with weekly sermons in the little, little village of Oni in England where both men lived. One of them was Cooper's celebrated hymn God moves in a mysterious way his wonders to perform. He plants his footsteps in the sea and rides upon the storm. Another by John Newton, a former sailor and slaver, was Amazing Grace. And it eventually set the all-time record for crossover hits. But in its time, Cooper's 1782 poem about Selkirk topped the charts, so to speak. 
It was the sound of a voice, an island voice, crying in a watery wilderness where fate conspired against free will and where home was poised uneasily between dream and nightmare. Islands are places where humans are especially vulnerable, surrounded by that inhospitable domain, the sea, a domain utterly indifferent to human desires and demands. But islands are also places that encourage notions of sovereignty and dominion. I am monarch of all I survey. And Cooper's poem in Selkirk's voice catches the illusion that complicates our response to climate change. The illusion that we can control some, if not all, of the forces of nature. We are convinced we must try, but we know, as Cooper did, that we live in the presence of powers, certainly natural, possibly supernatural, that are greater than us. Which is why we use the word pollution, a word with ancient religious associations, to describe our desecration of the environment. Both climate change itself and our explanations and responses to it go back a long time on this island planet of ours. And periods of often extreme climate change have defined life on Earth forever. In our home in Half Moon Bay, my wife Lorna Goodison and I have a horse's cannon bone, about so long, fossilized, and a fossil ivory elephant's tusk. They were given to us by a friend in the Yukon, in the north of Canada, a land of ice and snow now. But 10,000 years ago, it was subtropical savanna, a place where elephants and horses roamed and where pineapples grew. On the other hand, the temperate climate of England once featured an Arctic tundra landscape. And one of the notable early, indeed the almost the inventor of prehistoric archaeology, Sir John Lubbock, Coyne, who coined the terms Neolithic and Paleolithic, found in the 1850s a muskox skeleton on this island of England. England had been underwater a number of times in its history, and these kinds of changes we need to remember to put our climate change in perspective. Not that we should do nothing about it, we should do everything we can about it, but to remember that cycles and changes are part of the history of the world. Now, another story about a couple of explanations of that sadly familiar phenomena of climate change, excuse me, a flood. The Gixan people of the northwest of British Columbia, that Simshan speaking indigenous people, First Nations as we call them, Aboriginal people in Canada. The Gixan people have lived in the mountains fishing and hunting and farming and trading for thousands of years. They have a story that tells of changes to one of the river valleys near the mountain called Stekuden, who crossed the village from Temlaksan. It was once the center of their world, one of those places that bring peace and prosperity to the people who live there. This valley nourished the Gixan people so well that they become un became unmindful of their good fortune and forgot the ways that the mountains and the rivers and the plants and the animals had taught them. The spirit of the valley, a grizzly bear called Mediac, who lived by Stachyuden, warned them and gave them many signs of his anger, but they ignored these warnings. Finally, Mediac got so angry that he came roaring down from the top of the mountain. Grizzlies running uphill are breathtakingly fast. I'd been chased by one, and he looked like a freight train impersonating a gazelle. But because their front legs are short, grizzlies sometimes slide or tumble coming downhill, and Mediac brought half the mountain with him, covering the valley floor and the village of Temlaksam and all the people there. Only a few survived, those who were out hunting in the high country or berry picking on the opposite slopes or doing the hard work that makes for an easy life. This was just about 3,500 years ago in the Gixan story. 
Over time, the people returned to the valley, and although never the rich and fertile home it once had been, it always held its place in their history, and they remember the great grizzly and the lesson he taught them. Their present day claims to the territory arise from the claims that the valley has on them, and the story in the grizzly of the grizzly and the slide confirm those claims. Several years ago, when the Gixan decided to assert their claims in the courts of the newcomers in the valley, that's people like me, they told this story. They told it with all the ritual that it required for the stories and songs that represent their past are about belief and therefore need ceremony. So to all stories, the Gixan realized, they also realized that the story of the grizzly in the sacred mountain called Stekyudin and the village of Temlak Sam which in their minds confirmed the presence of their people in that place for millennia, might not be believed by the judge, schooled as he was in stories of a different sort. So one of their leaders, Neil Sterrett, suggested they draw on another storyline to complement their own. They had geologists drill under the lake that fills the valley and take a core sample and analyze it, a scientific ceremony. They discovered soil and plant material which matched that high up on the mountain slope, exposed where the grizzly had taken down the hillside, or where the earthquake had produced a slide that brought down half the mountain and flooded the valley. And the sample was dated exactly when their story said the grizzly grew angry with the people in the valley 3,500 years ago. The court was inclined to see the scientific story as confirming the legendary one. However, the elders of the Gixan were at pains to persuade the judge that each story was validated by the other, that neither had a monopoly on understanding what happened, that the storyline of geology was framed by a narrative as much the product of invention as a story told by their people, and that each storyteller's imagination, whether telling of tectonic plates or of grisly outrage, was engaged with discovering a reality that included much more than the merely human. The story of the grizzly is a very old one, hardened on an anvil of ancient tellings and tested by memories that disputed it for much longer than our seismic and sedimentary theories. The Gixan believe both of them. Both for them are true. Both help the people live their lives and both are revealed in stories. Another image comes to mind. In my office uh, at home in Half Moon Bay, where Lorna and I live, I have pictures of two women. One is Joe Jimmy's mother. Joe Jimmy and I were hunting guides together in the East Kootenays. And the other is Petrus Falbui's mother. Petrus is the leader of the Romani, a, a, a Bushman group putting a land claim forward in the Kalahari that I was involved in. Mrs. Jimmy was the last native speaker of Northern Kootenai, a language quite distinct from all the languages around it. Elsie Falbui was almost the last what a dozen others have found, a speaker of a language called Nu, the language of the Romani people in the Kalahari. And one of the things I think we need to remember when we celebrate, nourish, and protect the diversity of species is that we need also to do everything we can to protect the diversity of languages. Languages like these have gone out of existence gone out of, of the speakers have died at an alarming rate over the past century. At least a thousand in Canada alone, dialects and languages. And with those languages go not only a way of life, but knowledge that we need. Knowledge that we need to dispute sometimes, as we do all knowledge, scientific, religious, artistic, but knowledge that's central to our ability to do all we can to live on this earth in a good way. We can learn by listening to a wide range of storytellers, not just those in science. Though scientists, I should add, 
are among our best storytellers, convincing us to believe their stories is true until they change them every century or so. It's always been that way with storytellers. It was and it was not, say the storytellers of Majorca, when they begin a tale. Once upon a time, we say, meaning right now. In the British Museum, there's an ancient Taino Aboriginal Arawak sculpture from Jamaica that portrays a bird on the back of a turtle. It represents a creation story that has wide currency among indigenous peoples in the Americas, the story of Turtle Island. The Maori of New Zealand tell of a bird lifting land out of the water. In other accounts of the origin of the earth, a bird drops dirt onto the back of a whale. In a story from Hawaii, a bird lays an egg that is fertilized by the sun. Still other stories describe how a bird makes a place to land out of twigs and branches. And many Polynesian legends depict islands being brought to the surface on a fish hook. That islands should be part of so many creation stories is hardly surprising, for they provide an image of the first moment when land was separated from the waters and human life was made possible. In stories of the end of the world, too, islands are usually the last place left, and their appearances and disappearances signify the cycles of climate change and seismic upheaval that make up and break up our world. Like floods, earthquakes, and volcanoes, islands are often associated with powers or forces beyond our comprehension, but fundamental to our understanding. Myths are often misunderstood as distancing us from such forces. In fact, they make them more real, not less. And the power of such myths comes not from the fact that fires and floods and climate changes that are their cause and effect are common across cultures, but from the way the stories about them bring together scientific and religious and artistic accounts, allowing each its own authority without discrediting the other. We believe such stories not only to make sense of the world or to take control of it, but also to remind ourselves that some things don't make sense and some things we can't control. The stories of religion show us how to accept those forces. The stories of science show us that we don't always have to. The stories given us by writers and dancers and singers and storytellers bring these accounts into conversation with each other and with us. Creation stories that begin with birds and turtles and fertilized eggs and fish hooks aren't mistaken explanations of historical incidents, but true explanations of the human condition and of our very human wonder about the mystery of creation and destruction, which is the mystery of islands and of climate change. Fostered alike by beauty and by fear, was how Wordsworth described his upbringing in the wild natural surroundings of his Lake District. Climate change is a grim prospect in many ways, but its fearsome possibilities also offer an opportunity to renew a kind of covenant in wonder with the world. It may well be our salvation, along, of course, with black bags and green bins. The Viennese call a person who looks after a house for someone a house bazorger literally a house worrier. We need to become the house worriers of wonder in our homes and our homelands. And our children, who know all about wonder from the stories and songs they read and listen to, as well as from the scientific storytellers in their schools, will help us live in a good way, always open to wonder and to wondering how to make the world a better place, whether the waters rise or fall. Thank you. Thank you. House Warriors of Wonder, that's a phrase I shall take away. Also, you mentioned grizzlies and the, uh, the freight train impersonating a gazelle. I would, I would love to have seen that routine. It's a shame we don't have time for it tonight, though. But introducing the, the historical perspective, as you did, and storytelling from places beyond Bristol, also the islands as well, especially thinking of low-lying islands, which are particularly susceptible um, to climate change. And more generally, protection of species and language and dialects. Really great to have those thoughts, so thank you, Ted. 
Right, we've got one more poet tonight, and it's time to meet him. It's Steve Duncan, an award-winning performance poet and inspirational speaker. Steve's co-founder of Insider Insight. He spent time inside as a prisoner and probationer and uses that insight and experience to help other people. So please give a very warm welcome to Steve Duncan. I'm going to take that prison thing out of my bio. It doesn't sound too good, does it? Okay, so I'm, um, yeah, it's good to be here. It's great, it's great to be here. It's, um, you know, an honour to be asked to take part in this and great to share the stage with such wonderful, wonderfully talented poets. So, yeah. I'm going to do a few pieces for you. I'm going to start with a performance piece, um, which is called Grandma's Philosophy. And, and, and I think it's really appropriate for this theme and for this setting because it really, it speaks about, you know, it speaks of a woman that was um, a grandmother to me, although not blood related, but she used to use a lot of phrases and a lot of quotes about how we should really respect our environment, respect each other and treat the planet and animals and people all the same. So this has got um, some of those connections in it. So I'm gonna do this piece for you first. My conscience will never be clear See, I'll forever hear the voice of grandma's philosophy bellowing at me. A woman that stood so upright, her very presence was scary. This contrasting controversy to popular belief that age is not really beauty. See, wisdom was her security. The voice of a visionary that was constantly killing me softly with profound truth. She'd echo verbal volleys that equated to the volume of a way and at the same time sing with the subtlety of a starling on a sunlit morning. She just kept calling. Come, kid, come, sit. Ex coffee, wheat, abix, prayer, meditation, spiritually fit, physical food, and spiritual food. This day belongs to you. And then, with the end of the psychic, she described everything I'd done wrong last night, and then successfully predict the potential conflict that was coming in to meet me. A miraculous feat indeed, but how could it be? Because she could barely see. She was losing her sight, but she still had God in her eyes. Her vision was never compromised. And she could see through the lies. And her lips bore the sores of the sorriest stories of the century. But she still managed to smile. Gratitude could never elude her. She'd mastered the art of the arduous task of acceptance. Being widowed in the civil war. But she was not a bit bothered because she knew what we was fighting for. And she could barely walk. But she swaggered those hips with the pride of someone that survived the slave ships and managed to dance through the storm. And the wrinkles in her face were just a slow drawn out pace in the race of perseverance. And the greys in her hair just the glittering of God's grace as if she'd been preserved to say something to you. Another guru taken for granted. So now for grandma's sake, I stay awake to a mirage of mistakes I made when the seed was already planted. And the only thing I miss more than grandma was her philosophy. Those moments of serenity where she gently sit me on her knee and look me in the eye and smile sarcastically and say, kid, it's not about the money, it's about the memories. The things we leave behind. Those that breed darkness and those that feed light have got the very power to either mutilate or redefine the shape of our hearts and shape of our minds. Memories. Because that's where legacy lives. And legacy is the greatest gift the human being can give because it's only in death that we're fully appreciated. So keep, keep thinking about the images you want to be given for your offspring to live in. And I don't just mean family. I mean whatever's living, consciously or subconsciously. This world will marry its memory of meeting you. Don't look at me, that was grandma's philosophy. See, grandma was deep. She even said be nice to the trees. Because even the breeze is your companion, and the sun sees every hand that moves wrongly, and scorches the serenity of its present karma. She said if life gets rough, it'll be karma. Because all life is but a sea of drama to be sailed in. And you'd be punished for some of the things you did do, and abused and wrongly accused for some of the things you didn't, but just keep forgiving. Because it's in that forgiveness you're given a chance of a life worth living, otherwise people get to live in your head rent-free constantly. And that's no way to be. And if we're all so different, why is it every human being that breathes leaves his genetic condensation somewhere within the Earth's capacity that gathers in the midst and gets eclipsed by a vision that can sometimes look cloudy and rowdy? So be careful when you shout, because the universe can hear you, and the universe will rehearse and reimburse the language you were there to, pulling you away from the very virtue of good character and noble stature, the emancipation for decency to match up to. See, Grandma used to say, at the end of the day, in judgment's fate, the only status that really matters and grants you any grace is embedded in your DNA anyway. In of being cryptid in the skin, festered in the flesh, unpeeled to reveal the naked truth of what harm did you scroll into the blood and the bones and where did it flow to? Or did you find your forgiveness and make this experience useful and neuter it neutral? What scars did you carve into the hearts of those that love you? What evaporates, departs and resonates as your residue and trickles down like constant raindrops of forget me nots to flood the world with your truth? See, Grandma said we should have bridal ceremonies for memories that we groom in our hearts and divorces and funerals for the bad parts. Because till death does it start. But this is not really about my grandma. This is about me and you and the struggles we go through. A grandma that we all need to go to. A philosophy that we all need to grow from. And the only thing I miss more than grandma is this philosophy. This very moment of serenity. Where I gently use the art of poetry to remind you that people, this is not about the money, it's about the memories. 
the things we leave behind. Those that breathe darkness and those that feed light have got the very power to either mutilate or redefine the shape of our hearts and shape of our minds, memories. Because that's where legacy lives. And legacy is the greatest gift a human being can give because it's only in death that we're fully appreciated. So people, keep thinking about the images you want to be given for your offspring to live in. And I don't just mean family. I mean whatever's living, consciously or subconsciously, this world will marry its memory of meeting you. Thank you. So um, I'm going to share another piece of you now. This is, um, you know, I do like um, like the rest of our, uh, my, my fellow brother and sister poets there. I, I also do a lot of work with um, young people and, um, you know, that's why I kind of chose to leave the kind of prison thing in my bio because actually that was an experience that has enabled me to use that experience and go on and, and kind of help others. So last year I was asked to, to write a poem for some young offenders that I was working with and um, you know, I kind of got commissioned to do that and I decided to write a piece called Hope because, you know, a lot of these guys have got very complex needs and, you know, quite deep issues and I, and, and I, and I just thought that really what they need is hope in that situation. That's what I needed when I was kind of going through my struggles and I think that how that relates to the, the theme of climate change is, someone else mentioned it in their, in their, in their poem earlier, you know, this theme of being powerless and not really certain things happening outside of your control and I think that no matter where we are in our lives at some point in time we all need a little bit of hope and I guess that the hope as it applies to climate change is that we can collectively come together at some point to do something about it so I guess there's a sense of powerlessness if we don't collectively do something and that's where the hope lies so I'm going to share this with you and what I'm going to ask you guys to do is to do it with me um yeah can you do that is that all right yeah so guys listen this requires timing, synchronicity, <laughs> unity, yeah? Especially you older guys, I don't want you coming in 20 seconds later and messing up my flow, you know what I mean? It's gotta be on point. I'm joking, I love you all, but someone's gotta be the butt of the jokes. So let's have a test run. So when I put my hand up, you guys are gonna say hope, yeah? Hope. I'll do better than that, this Ha ha ha, very funny. Ready? Hope. That's brilliant. There's a song in our souls that sings for more, and its chorus is full of hope. Is the treatment of all spiritual sickness but never the cure. Hope. Is the road less travel that has no destination. Because no matter how far you've come on this journey, you cannot escape the inevitable need for Because regardless of our present situation, through the interchangeable phases of our lives, we're all defied at times by that one-liner, that elusive quotation, the one that defines all universal language, the one that without which all other virtue would never exist, is constantly defended by faith and courage, the one that typifies and signifies the underlying message of all spiritual notes. So let me break it down for you. Hope, H-O-P-E, happy other people exist. Hope, H-O-P-E, harnessing other people's experiences, positive and negative. Hope, H-O-P-E, having open perception to education so you can learn from it. Hope, if at any time you're struggling to remember, hope is H-O-P-E, that halo of a promised emancipation. Because regardless of the situation, keep on persevering and you will see hope become a tangible reality. You will feel hope, H-O-P-E, hearty old, hearty old process this has ended. Hope, hope, hope. I'm going to ram it down your throat until you're sick of it. Until it cuts you insides and starts to bleed your insecurities. Until it seeps into your skin and begins to define you. Till no boundaries can confine you. Till the sky is never too high for you to soar through. Because it's proper propaganda to believe that you should never have your head in the clouds. Because we were born to stand out. To get higher and higher and deeper and deeper and more philosophical. Because hope is the antidote to suppressing your perception of the possible. Because hope loves you. Yes, you, you, you. With all your warts and all your flaws and all these rules and all these laws. Because God doesn't make mistakes. He just made you in a way where you can learn from yours. Because hope means no one's beyond redemption. Everybody's got a dignity that needs to be affirmed with the correct attention. Because hope exists for this very reason. To weather the storms and the rainy seasons. So no matter how far down the scale you go, I want you to know that this poem is with you. Because we've all got grace and we've all got scope. As long as we'd be willing to just keep clinging to... Right, so this one's going to be a bit slower. Some of you might be pleased about that. But, um, so... You know, the interesting thing for me, you know, in, in being asked to write a poem about climate change, you know, that was um, really quite challenging for me because I didn't know that much about it before I was asked to do it. 
I still don't know that much about it, to be fair. But um, I guess it wasn't really something I was even that concerned about. You know, I do like to write a, 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 about a whole array of subjects, you know, social, social justice being, being one of the things I'm really passionate about. But, um, you know, the, the, the thing that I discovered about myself was my own ignorance towards climate change, but also other people's. You know, I've spoken to a lot of people about this since I've been writing it. And to be honest with you, I only finished it today. I've got to be honest. It's probably not the best admission to make in terms of getting commissioned again, but it is about honesty, you know what I'm saying? Uh, so, yeah, that's where we are. So, <laughs> you know, but all's well that ends well, as they say. Um, but, yeah, so, so I, I chose to kind of make the focus of this poem uh, around that very issue, the, the fact that we're kind of ignorant to it, and even those that are aware of it don't really think that it's that much of an issue or that much of a threat, so here we are. Last night I heard the wind talking, the breeze singing, symphonies of things unseen and things undone and things yet to come. I observed raindrops getting in a muddle, then overheard the pub puddles conversing about how they wished they could disperse more evenly through the universe to soak up any drought. I heard the moon prophesy that the tide was going to rise too high and flood us out like the days of Noah. I saw the stars darken with frustration in anticipation of our human evolution towards certain destruction. This morning I saw the sun shrinking, grieving for summers that will soon be extinct. And you might think I'm mad, but I'm merely tuning in. See, I can hear the moral dialogue of the atmosphere. The clouds are debating our fate, because everybody's fearing nuclear, but there's a war going on to which most of us are unaware. Because even those who know still don't really care. See, most of us think it's a joke, a government conspiracy or even a hoax. So what do you think? Are you connected or estranged to the calamity of climate change? See, most folk are out of sync with the significance of the simplest things, like recycling, putting different things in different bins to salvage some salvation. So can you make a connection to the injection of fuel into your petrol pump and the emissions that affect the future generations? So what about the governments that conspire with scientists, scientists to disguise their lies so the corporates can function? What about our addiction to consumption? What about the environmental refugees that have to flee an already poverty-stricken state only to be ignored by the state. See, our ignorance is bliss. And what about our kids that even don't that don't even know that CO2 exists? The only crops they're seeing is the weed that they're smoking their spliffs. They're getting high on their <laughs> they're getting high on their own. I can't even read my right now. They're getting high on their on their own fumes and they're disconnected to their own surroundings. Do you do you think the kids where I live give a shit about the polar caps melting or penguins surviving or polar bears not getting any polar bears not getting any fish to eat? This is no climate change for the mindless brains that are stuck inside the thinking of their own social misery. There is no climate change for the powers that be that are obsessed with the greed of their own security. Because the truth will set us free. If we can muster the courage, we begin the climate change when we start at the point of our own social injustice. See, we need to turn it in before the universe starts turning in on us to spontaneously combust and express its disgust at us. Or maybe that's just the must we need. Maybe we'll never be at ease. Maybe we'll never experience true freedom or any economical peace. At least not until. Not until we've exhausted all the extremities, all the natural resources, the God-given gifts that replenish this existence we live in. Not till the sun stops smiling and the moon declines to give us light at night. Not till every river's run dry and the leaves of every tree have been scorched in rainforest fires by frustrated kids that live in high rises. Not till every last teardrop erodes the mountaintops and we're swimming in our own sorrow watching the earthquake in its own grief where we see that you cannot eat money. See, one day we're going to wake up to the aftermath of the wreckage of our past to face the utmost certainty that this was all just forbidden fantasy, that it was really just a game. And the paradox of winning was simply in treating the people, the animals and the planets as one and the same.